Uh, my name is Dominic Moreno. I am a council member in Commerce City, Colorado. Uh, Commerce City is a community of about 46,000 just north of Denver. And I have to admit that you're getting a bit of the second string here. Uh, my mayor has actually been um, extremely involved in uh, cooperating and creating uh, investment opportunities with China. And unfortunately, sometimes uh, term limits get the best of us. Uh, so he wasn't able to be with us today, but I agreed to fill in for him. Uh, Commerce City is home to a, a number of international companies. We're uh, heavily industrial and manufacturing corridor. Uh, so we're home to companies such as Suncor Energy, uh, actually Colorado's only uh, oil refinery, and it's actually a Canadian company, as well as some other companies like uh, Shum, Shum, I always get confused saying this, it's the French company, Schlumberger, as well as um, uh, Cummins Engines, uh, among others. Um, so what we're here to discuss is, is how local communities can get involved in um, in attracting and that foreign direct investment. In 2010, U.S. communities received $228 billion in new investment from foreign investors, creating new jobs, boosting wages, increasing exports, strengthening existing industries, and raising productivity. Local elected and economic development leaders will showcase how their communities have benefited from foreign direct investment and how they organize to attract it. Attendees will learn how, with patience, partnerships, and planning, they can effectively pursue FDI. Given the def difficult economic climate, many communities are exploring new avenues for economic investment, including investment from foreign businesses. In Commerce City, for example, uh, our mayor was able to uh, develop relationships with China through the Sister Cities program. And I was just curious, how many communities here are sister cities in some for, with some foreign city? It's a, great, it's a great way to be able to develop those relationships, not only on a superficial level where, you know, uh, delegates come and visit, but also be able to uh, talk with those communities about what they need and if they would like to invest in the United States. Uh, our mayor was instrumental in working with uh, mayors around the Denver metropolitan region in creating a U.S.-China cooperative zone that extends all the way north to Fort Collins and all the way south to the cattle ranches of Trinidad, Colorado. And the reason why that was beneficial is when Chinese companies look at locating in the United States, they immediately take notice of Denver and the fact that we are open for business and wanting to do business with those Chinese companies. Uh, one of the aspects in Chinese culture that's in growing demand is the uh, need for uh, American-produced uh, beef. And some of the cattle ranches in Colorado uh, are now partnering with Chinese companies to directly ship their, uh, the beef that they produce to Chinese companies and not have to go through a middleman. So that's one of the great um, results that we've been able to produce through the U.S.-China uh, US Cooperative Zone in Denver. So what we're going to discuss in this session today and what we'll address is what exactly is foreign direct investment? What are the trends? What industries are most likely to attract foreign direct investment? And which type of communities? Should my, com should my community pursue foreign investment? And if so, what are some of the local and regional strategies? And how can we organize regionally? What are the challenges of pursuing foreign investment? I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce our uh, guest speakers. Uh, first being Chris Knight, Senior Accountant Manager of US FDI Intelligence in London, England. Chris Knight heads the FDI Benchmark Division of the FDI Intelligence, in addition to serving as a business development executive focusing on the U.S. and U.K. markets, and is an expert in the benchmarking of locations. He has been working on benchmarking projects for more than four years and has worked with some of the largest economic development organizations globally to help them promote themselves to foreign investors and assess their competitiveness for investment. Chris develops bimonthly rankings of various sectors, including in-house data, which are published in FDI magazine, 
the most recent of these rankings, identifying the best locations globally for attracting renewable energy FDI projects. As well as benchmarking, Chris works on a variety of different reports comparing market and sectoral performance in terms of FDI. Please help me welcome Chris Knight. Our other guest speaker, Barry Broom, is president and CEO of the Greater Phoenix Economic Council here in Phoenix, Arizona. Barry Broom is uh, president of the Economic Council. With over 17 years' experience in economic development, he is shaping uh, the Economic Council to become the leading economic development organization in the nation by 2010. Under Broom's leadership, GPEC and Greater Phoenix have achieved notable wins, including the launch of a statewide international program to attract foreign investment, the commission of a fact-based analysis that led to the enactment of 80% sales factor enabling Arizona to better compete for multi-state corporations, and the initiation of the Community Building Consortium, led by real estate development professionals to accelerate responsible development through product, through product planning and process. Please help me welcome Barry. And now I'll turn it over to Chris. Thank you. Um, just get my presentation. Uh, firstly, thanks everybody for turning up today at 3 o'clock on a Friday. I know if we were back home in Ireland, people would be going to the bar rather than come to see me talk, so we're actually impressed with the turnout. Um, so, I'm Chris Knight um, from FDI Intelligence, which is part of the Financial Times newspaper group. Uh, so, we basically focus on everything to do with foreign direct investment. You'll have seen at the back of the room, uh, we've got our FDI magazine, which is a bi-monthly magazine um, interviewing governors, uh, presidents uh, throughout the world, telling you what's happening. Uh, we then have our online databases, FDI Markets, which tracks all FDI around the world, and FDI Benchmark, which allows you to benchmark locations. So today, uh, I'm going to talk to you about F some FDI trends, looking at what's happening in the U.S., where there's some future opportunities, uh, some companies who you might want to target. Then I'm going to move on to some best practices. Uh, I'm, I wouldn't say I'm an expert, but what we, have do we do is we work with over 200 economic development organizations throughout the world. So I'm going to share with you some of what we think are their best practices in bringing foreign direct investment to your cities or states. Okay, so the start of my presentation, there's going to be a lot of numbers, so feel free to put your hand up as we go along if you want some clarification on what the numbers mean, rather than trying to remember it all for the end. So, firstly, it's good to see global FDI is starting to recover. You can see that um, in 2009, there was a decline of 17% in terms of project numbers, but that has started to come back in 2010, where there was a 2% growth. Although project numbers are growing globally, the um, number of new job creation have continued to decline. So the projects are becoming much smaller. So instead of possibly a lot of auto manufacturing, you're getting more small software development centers, multimedia centers. So there's a shift in the type of FDI which is happening. With our data, uh, we actually do up to real time. So I can see that from January to September of this year, uh, FDI data is on course to outperform the previous two years. So it looks like we're coming back um, and it's going to continue. The good news for you guys is FDI to the USA continued to grow even in 2009. And you can see, uh, last year, FDI projects into the whole of the United States increased by 20%. But not only do we capture foreign investments, in the United States we're looking at interstate investments, so investment from one state to the other. And we can see that that also increased by 23% last year. Okay, um, looking at the start of this year, from January to September, we can see that there's been al already, compared to the same period last year, been a 14% increase in all investments to the USA. And if the, the remainder of this year continues uh, the way it has been, it's due to be the best year for foreign investment. So where are these investments going in the United States? And how is this? This is looking at this year, but let's see. Where, 
the leading state in terms of overall investments, both interstate and foreign, is California, followed by Texas, New York, Florida. But then if you see um, the third column over, looking at who's getting the foreign projects, not the interstate, suddenly New York jumps above Texas in these rankings. Um, and as well, Georgia would go above Illinois and Indiana in attracting the foreign investments. We also look at, well, which states are creating the most jobs? And Texas actually goes into number one position. So the type of project must be much larger scale. But for me, I, I like numbers. So I look at the growth. So compared to last year, what are the trends? And we can see the leading growth has actually been in these top three states, California, Texas, and New York, and with California having a 35% increase in project numbers compared to the same period last year. The only two in this um, top list which have declined is Florida and Georgia, who have both seen a decline in their overall investments. So I thought, as we're at National League of Cities, let's go down to the next tier. Let's see which cities are receiving these investments. Uh, and New York remains number one, followed by San Francisco, Chicago, Houston. But then if you're looking at the foreign projects, Chicago has only had 17, whereas places like LA and Miami have had over 20. So it's interesting just to look at the difference in the type of project and who's being successful um, on a global scale rather than in the United States. Uh, looking at San Francisco, they've had a 50% increase in their project numbers um, at the start of this year compared to the same period last year. And forgive me, I only have got like the top nine cities because if I did any more, you wouldn't be able to see it. So if your city isn't on it and you want the information, just let me know and I can check that up for you. Uh, some of the biggest declines, actually, Washington and Atlanta, which have witnessed an 8% and a 12% decline in overall project numbers this year. So that's setting the scene, what's happening in the United States um, and where the projects are going to. It's interesting next to look at, well, is there a shift in what industry these are involved in? So we can see the leading industries are financial services, ICT, professional services, transport equipment. Those are, tend to be the leading um, clusters anywhere in the world. But interestingly, the biggest growth for the United States in this year compared to last year has been witnessed in industrial and uh, in professional services and creative industries. And I'd like to just note the creative industries because with, with my work globally, I'm finding a huge shift towards creative industries. This is the new must-have market. So renewable energy, maybe four years ago, you've seen this sharp increase. And although it is still increasing, creative industry seems to be where there's a great opportunity uh, and you could tap into that and be one of the pioneers in getting this type of investment. Looking at where there's been the largest decline this year compared to last, we, we've seen it has been in food and beverages cluster. So a lot of that will be in the manufacturing side, I'm sure. So next, if we're looking at um, the actual activity of these projects, not, not the sector, but is it a headquarters, is it R&D, what are these companies doing? We can see the leading is business services, followed by manufacturing and then sales and marketing offices. But the biggest growth has been seen in electricity, although that was from a very small basis, as you can see on the far right-hand side. The one that I, I would be most impressed about is looking at this 43% increase in R&D investments. So R&D tends to be creating high-value jobs, and this is the investment that every city in the world wants to get. So R&D to the United States is really increasing this year. Uh, the largest decline compared to the period last year is in ICT and internet infrastructure, so a 28% decline. So the next thing that I want to talk about and hopefully share with you is identifying where the opportunities are. You know, so FDI, foreign investment, is a, it's a big topic. You need to narrow it down and decide, well, where are we going to put our resources? There's no point going somewhere where there's no investments coming from. So you can see from the pie charts that last year and this year, um, source region, Western Europe, that's where most of the projects to the United States, the foreign projects to the United States come from. 
although you can see that this has taken a bit of a knock in 2011, and there has been large increases, particularly uh, in FDI coming from North America, so this Canada and Mexico, with a 47% increase, and also from the rest of Europe, so your Eastern Europe, 33% um, increase. When I was doing these figures, I, I'm making a point of this because it, it shocked me in looking at the decline of FDI from Latin America this year. Because everywhere I read, it's like the opportunities coming out of Latin America. But I've actually, looking at our numbers, there's been a 13% decline. Just like when we go through looking further uh, in terms of FDI from China, if you were asking me where the opportunities were, I would probably be saying, well, not in China. I would be looking elsewhere. And we'll be going into that in the next slide. Um, there's also new opportunities, and I've heard several people talking about it in the last few days, uh, from Africa, to and from Africa. So last year, there were zero foreign investments from African companies coming to the United States. Already this year, there has been five. Although that doesn't sound many, it's obviously going in the right direction. So this is new opportunities for you guys to look out for. So looking at the source markets, I thought I would do a slide and say where the projects to the United States are coming from, as well as looking at which locations are growing as a source country, but more importantly, what is the number one sector from each of these countries? So still, interstate is the number one investment for, for the US. It, that will never change. Um, most companies will invest internally before they're going to start investing abroad. But looking beyond that, uh, we can see it's the UK followed by Germany and Canada as the leading source countries for these investments. But where I think it much more important to look at is this growth in projects. And the three I would make note to you is Canada, India and Australia. So you can see Indian investments, far more than Chinese, have increased 110% in project numbers this year. And with Australia, well, I've, I've based myself in Australia for the past year, um, and I know, like, at first hand, their economy is booming. Their, their currency is so strong. Now is the perfect time to look for Australian companies because anyone I talk to in Australia can't wait to come over to the United States because they can buy anything. They're so rich by the time they get paid in a call centre. So it's about even currency now. And I was chatting to my friend working in a call center, and he was getting paid $35 an hour in Sydney. Um, working on a farm, because my best friend's doing it to get a second-year visa, he's getting paid $25 an hour. He's getting paid 60 hours a week, and he works about 40. So that's the type of economy and how they're getting paid now. Um, Australia, but then if you look at the flip side, so again, an Irish person, I need to bring it back to what we understand. To buy a crate of beer in Australia for 24 beers, it costs $44. So it's expensive as well. It's, the economy is completely booming at the minute. So you can see, if you're going to look at Canada, India, Australia, their number one sector for outward investment is actually software and IT. So if your city has got an offering in software, these are some of the countries you should really be looking to tap into. Okay. And then with our database, we take it to that next step. We have got a lead generation module which tells you companies who are intending to invest abroad. So if you take a look at Australia, the example Goodman Group from Australia want to open new operations. They said they're considering the US or Latin America, and their industry is real estate. If you're going to India, you might want to speak to Paramal Healthcare. Um, they've just raised finance for expansion. They're looking at Europe or North America in the pharmaceutical sector. Or if you're looking at the UK, Aberdeen Asset Management, um, they're looking for some new markets. And they, they've mentioned to us they're looking at North America, Asia, and Latin America. And that's financial services. So these are some of the companies who are intending to invest abroad in the coming years. So, conclusions on the FDI trends. Well, the first one is good news, how the U.S. is outperforming the global market in attracting FDI. A few of the reasons I would put that down to is the EU debt crisis and the instability there's been this year in the Middle East, a natural disaster of Japan, the stronger growth prospects there currently are, and also with a cheap dollar, it's making it very economical for companies to set up location here. Uh, while New York remains the number one city in FDI, there's been strong growth from San Francisco, from LA, Dallas, from Miami. 
Um, it's interesting to note because one of the things we looked at is the importance of FDA. So if you look at all investments coming to the U.S., two-thirds of that is interstate, but that still leaves a huge chunk. One-third of all investments coming to the U.S. are from foreign companies. So if you're not tapping into that market, you've basically lost out on a third of the companies who could be investing in your city. Um, the largest investors to the U.S. are U.K., followed by Germany and Canada. But as I said, some of the strong growth potential is Canada, India, Australia. If you look further down the list, which I don't have with me now, but uh, Scandinavia, that's another player who's really investing outwardly. Uh, and then even in Europe, Western Europe, and the reason being is because of the mess that we have at home. They have to look to new markets for them to make their investments. So that's the FDI trends. We decided to look at, well, what are the motives? Why do companies infect, choose to invest in the United States as a whole? And you can see the key motive that companies have told us is proximity to customers. That is the number one reason people will come to the United States, followed by the market growth potential, the skilled workforce, uh, the good infrastructure. So those are the main motives. I thought it would be interesting to take a look at motives in terms of, well, for manufacturing companies, because their motives are going to be different to R&D, different to back office operations. For manufacturing companies, um, so proximity is still number one, but you have things like IPA and government support, which become much more important. Um, so the work that you are doing becomes much more important for manufacturing projects. Uh, incentives, you can see that shoots up the list in terms of manufacturing, whereas maybe in R&D, incentives wouldn't be a key indicator. Next, looking at the key motives for R&D investments, suddenly skilled workforce by far leads this. It no longer is a proximity to customers. Skilled workforce is what these foreign companies want from the U.S. for R&D investments. In terms of back office operations, you can see how many of them want skilled workforce. But then secondly is government support and then regulations. So this is very important. And the point I'm trying to make with these motives is it's important for you to understand the reasons for foreign companies to invest and adjust what you're, do, what you're offering depending on who you talk to. So don't always go with a one-size-fits-all to a foreign company. Try and work out what they're planning and doing and basically get them the data which backs up what you need to be telling them. So... That's the first part. The second part, I'm going on to a few things which, again, a lot of this I got from not only my work with companies, but I've contacted foreign direct investment consultants around the world, and I've asked for some of their input in getting some best practice in terms of getting these foreign companies to your cities. The first and probably the most important, I think, is um, how you handle inquiries from foreign companies. So handling investor inquiries, this is critical to your success in attracting foreign investment. We found that the most successful EDOs, and the one I mentioned, Singapore, um, who have been successful for year, maybe 10, 20 years, they actually target a 50% conversion rate of inquiries from inquiries to getting an actual investment. So that is a huge percentage that they're looking to get, because I don't know about you, but in our work, we get so many junk inquiries every day that to get 50% is huge. So what we have then looked at is, well, what are some of the best practices in handling an inquiry? So what should you do when you receive this? Firstly, we think you should profile a company. Do a bit of research, find out as much as you can about the company, and then prioritize inquiries based on the quality of the company. You may also have a different approach in how you want to respond to companies, depending on if you rate it as like investment paramount or just a good to have. So you can rank the companies. Next, now this is critical. It sounds simple, but understanding an investor's requirements. For you to answer what they come to you, you need to understand what they want and why they want it. So I think that's important to note. Also, we have found some best practice is appointing a single client executive to respond to inquiries. The reason we suggest that is to remain consistent. So you're, you don't have like completely different type of language being used by different people. You're always using the same data sources and portraying the city with the same information. 
Next, a lot of these companies want this information quick. They don't want to wait for a full presentation from you. So I, I would say respond rapidly, providing accurate, timely information and data. Don't provide them all your marketing literature. Um, I know the World Bank done a study maybe three years ago which said they, they contacted all investment agencies around the world and they said it was a simple inquiry like possibly um, what's the size of your cluster in software and they, they claimed that 80% of economic development organizations did not answer that question in responding to them. They either sent through all their marketing literature or they sent through a full um, proposal to invest in their location. What we think is responding rapidly, you're building the relationship. They know they can trust you to give the information they want. So when they actually have an active investment, they know that Bob from Oklahoma is going to be able to give them what they need and not give a whole lot of rubbish that is irrelevant. Uh, next, it's important to ensure the confidentiality of the investor's project and strategy at all times. This may mean limiting the number of people involved within your organization, and even if it is required by the client, sign a confidentiality agreement just to say that you're going to keep everything private. Um, another thing you can do is you can gently encourage um, foreign companies who are in your region uh, to be positive to the investor. This can be through testimonials. Maybe you want to set up a dinner, just a quick chat, so they can say how they have found a transition in your economy. Um, another important one, and this is particularly for major projects, is ensuring an understanding of the project and key ministries and agencies at the national level. So that's really important if it's a huge project, not for everyday projects. Um, encouraging diplomatic service visits to the corporate headquarters as well. That, that's always seen favorable um, for major projects. Next, and Probably the most important, finally, is preparing a high-quality business case or proposal to the investor. And what we suggest um, that you require in this is a good brief from the investor, so understanding what they want, provision of the relevant data that they need on the market and the business opportunity, um, provision of comparable data, because they, they always want to benchmark it back to their own location so they understand better the pros and cons of your location. And a clear commitment from the EDO to deliver the project. Okay, so that's first, best practice. Second is website. So website is critical because a high quality inward investment website, this is basically your community's door to the outside world. This is the first thing they will see when they think of your location. Uh, and nowadays, as I stated there, the internet has become the primary method companies use for site selection research. So a website is not only about the information provision and image building, it's also a primary tool for generating investment leads. So again, some of the best practices we believe in website development include being highly visible. That, to me, this is the number one. Not hidden away within a wider economic development website. Um, invest in, say, Belfast. It's the most used U URL for community inward investment websites. So being able to actually find the company need to be able to find the why invest in before they will even contact you. One way to do this is by sponsoring search engine AdWords to raise awareness of your location. Um, some of the things that we would say to clients that your website as a minimum should cover about us, your services, economic o overview of your community. Now, the one I think is most important is sectoral business opportunities. People want to go quickly and see, well, what are your key sectors? Because no city is good at everything. You need to know what your key sectors are and explain them well. You then news and publications, um, if you've got an incentives regime, um, and then have an inquiry form. Advanced websites may want to include real estate and partner searches, and also GIS. Um, the number of, we also think that all cities, states, etc., they really should be monitoring the number of inquiries they get, how many become leads, active cases, and realized investments, possibly through a CRM, and being able to monitor um, the percentage of these which you're closing into actual investments. And that, that's a good way to judge your website, we believe. 
Next is um, the cluster approach, which, if you're like me, I've read about this everywhere, but until I actually started writing this, I never knew where it originated from. So many, peop- many cities, states around the world are trying to redevelop a cluster approach to replicate the success of Silicon Valley. But I don't know, maybe you all know much more than me, but the term actually originates from northern Italian 19th century industrial districts, which, are, which still today um, has, are the global leaders in many niche areas of machine tools and components. They, they actually boast that 60% of the input of a BMW comes from Italy. So I, had never, I never knew this, so I just thought I'd put it in in case you didn't know it either. Um, so for inward investment, what is the relevance in clusters and for foreign companies? The first one is branding. So clusters can very successfully be marketed to investors um, because they often cut across several towns, cities, states. So you, you actually have a proper economic area to promote. Like As I said, that's only assuming that the economic development organizations work together to promote it. The next one, um, the cluster helps with sector development. So what I've done is, so clustering allows EDOs to take a more holistic view of the sector. Um, So the example I used is if you have a strong finance sector, a cluster analysis may show you areas for further growth, you know, such as software companies who give, provide their services to the financial sector. So you can actually start to target financial software as well as traditional finance companies. Um, So a lot of these won't be immediately recognized as part of the finance sector. Um, Similarly, you'll get observations like that in every industry. You know, one of the ones in Cardiff and Wales that they were talking about. So they've always done aerospace manufacturing, particularly wings of aircraft. And they wanted to change these skills and start building um, wind farms because they said it's the same same labor skill sets to make wings of aircraft as it is to make um, the blades. So they're starting to go into that development. Then finally, there's the supply chain development. So many EDOs have supply chain programs to facilitate linkages between inward investors and suppliers in the community. If you were to do a detailed supply chain analysis, analysis, you can identify gaps in this supply chain which could be filled by foreign companies. Okay. And then finally is locations as risk takers. So the term entrepreneurial state, it's often used to describe those governments and EDOs which support business startups, either through major policy initiatives or by investing heavily in a major catalyst project. So examples of catalyst projects, they are things like major real estate projects, Media City in Dubai. So this is now, I was up last week, it's now being copied in Manchester in England. They weren't really original with the name, they called it Media City Manchester. Um, And then there's the International Finance Service Centre in Ireland, which are doing the same as in Dubai also. You then have major infrastructure projects such as new ports, broadband, etc., Then examples of policies um, to generate startups include one I read about last week is Startup Chile. So the government are giving $50,000 to anyone in the world to start up a business in Chile. That's assuming, yeah, you you have to meet all the criteria. You know, you can't just go and open a newspaper shop and get 50 grand. Um, So that's quite a good one, I think. Then you've got certain regions in France, they're going for like diaspora um, investment. In other words, they're looking to attract French expats back to their communities to set up business by offering them good support packages. So they're trying to bring people from England, the French people back to France and bring investment. An interesting one which is currently being done and starting to take off um, is people wanting to leverage this $4 trillion plus in sovereign wealth funds for their local economy. Scottish Development International, um, so that's the EDO for the whole of Scotland, they they typically are pioneers. They were one of the first in Europe to do the cluster approach. They're always trying to be ahead of the game. And their latest one they're doing, so they've developed a program to attract sovereign wealth to invest in Scottish projects and companies. 
Um, and there's also economic development organizations in the Middle East who have developed strong programs to attract sovereign wealth funds um, into their local projects. So that's just a few of what I think are some of the best practices, you know, which can help you in getting foreign companies to your region. So you can ask some questions at the end, but for now, that's me. Thanks. stuff. Right. Okay, so that we'll have Q&As. I'll knock this down in 15 minutes. A um, couple of things. I think one of the things when you work on foreign direct investment, um, I think you got to apply street smarts. And, uh, you know, just a couple little tidbits if you're going to start doing FDI work. Um, if you look at people, uh, I talked to some of the staff at the uh, League of Cities, you get in a lot of trouble when you bring 40, 50 people into a country. So um, I have a, a Greater Phoenix Economic Council. We're in China today. We sent one guy. So the press isn't there. No one's wondering what we're doing. They're not waiting to grab my expense report. I rarely go as the president on a foreign direct investment visit because I'm the guy's expense report they want to see most. Um, so when you set up an FDI strategy, you know, think in terms of being street smarts. And top-line data and top-line information is a good place to start but it's kind of like a scratch and sniff program. You know, you're, you know, the data is going to be a relevant path to start with, but you're going to mine through data, and then you're going to mine through tendencies, and then you're going to mine through culture, then you're going to mine through social behavior, mine through political behavior, and then you're going to start to find places where you can actually get traction. Uh, we're one of the more successful regional economic development groups in the country. Uh, we were recently named by DCI International as the number one economic development organization in the country, among 50 rated by 350 site selector consultants about three months ago. It was out of the International Economic Development Conference, and we didn't even go. So, um, so usually you pay for those. So I didn't pay for that. Uh, I didn't buy the most ads from Site Selection Magazine to get that award. Um, yeah, so if you want to win an award, just so you know, advertisement has a lot to do with it. Um, this is kind of a relevant ranking of, of capital investment into the United States. It rank was a little bit different than FDI. And I'll give you some of the street smart lessons for, from Phoenix. Phoenix is the fifth biggest city. There are 20 cities and 155 companies in two counties that make up GPAC. So we're the ninth largest market in the United States. And I'm never getting a deal out of London. Never. So I go to London. They're like New Yorkers. If you're a New Yorker, this is not a compliment, but it's not a slam either. No one in New York wants to do a lot of stuff in Phoenix, and people in London aren't going to do a lot of stuff in Phoenix. And the food's not that good either, so I don't really care, okay? Uh, and we were talking about accents. I mean, my mother was born in Ireland, so I understand an Irish accent quite well. I couldn't even understand people when I was in the pubs in London. So uh, the Guinness was pretty good. It was fun. I uh, couldn't hardly understand people. No one's going to do any deals in London. If you look at the data right now in, in the state of Arizona, we should be in London all the time. Somebody's making, well, there's tons of aerospace companies in London. There's obviously a lot of inner uh, global trade and aerospace sectors because everybody who does defense contracts has a reciprocal relationship. So if a company like Boeing and Honeywell here in the Valley uh, are doing defense work for the UK, then some defense-related industries in London get work laid off, and it creates this inflated FDI trade number between London and Phoenix, and we all think there's some action there, but what it really is is two or three big companies entering into aerospace trade in a market to reciprocate their obligations and government contracts. Outside of that, there's no real activity. So as you go down, and when you look at these top-line data, if you're in Nebraska, got a mayor from Nebraska here, UK might be his number one trade partner. Uh, it's probably Germany or Canada. They're in there somewhere. So as you look at these top-line numbers, this is kind of top-line numbers in the United States. That it, it uh, looks similar in Arizona. One of the things in Arizona, it's a little least China's number three now. Our number one trade partner is Mexico. So when you look at top-line numbers, they're a good place to start. 
but you kind of got to go through and really scrub definitively. So here's what I learned in Arizona. We're, why don't we open an office in London? Because people from London l- look at us like we're cowboys and Indians. There's just no reason to go there. There's no cultural inclination. I think London basically does business in the United States, predominantly in Boston and New York. And after that, it's some spillover effect. But if you want to know where people get received, where you see decision makers, there's some people in here that matters. If you're not coming out of Boston and New York, for the most part, I don't see a lot of action in London. Um, I think Holland's very interesting. Germany is a big opportunity for the Mountain West region. So Oregon's done a great job in Germany. Germany is, is the number one solar market in the world. Um, but so obviously we're the number two solar market in the United States behind California. We should be doing really well in Germany, but we're not. Why? Because the German solar market understands how to evaluate feed-in tariffs, which is a specific type of energy policy that Arizona doesn't buy into. So they assessed us based upon how they understand how their technology gets taken up. Oregon had, was much more inclined to have the personality of that. So the state of Oregon has done much better with German companies than Arizona has, even though we're overwhelmingly a stronger solar market than Oregon, because the Germans know how to do business in the solar industry with overcast. So they didn't see the sun as a big, not, not being in Oregon as a big deal, because it's not there in Germany. And once they went through Oregon policy, they saw Oregon's energy policy more closely reflective of theirs. So they're now going into Oregon. And Oregon may be the next Solyndra, uh, because they're over incentivized and they're all up front. Now, we've passed Oregon in the sector, but within Germany, the world leader in solar that does eight times the amount of U.S. performance in solar, they just evaluated our energy policy. Oregon's looked more closely to theirs, so they went to Oregon. So, you know, you really got to mine through all these top-line numbers. One of my favorite stories about going to Germany was I went by myself. I landed to call on solar companies, and two things dawned on me when I landed. Number one, I could not speak German. And number two, I didn't know anything about solar technology. But I didn't really think of that until I was getting off the plane in Frankfurt. I was like, you know, I should have thought of that. And um, so think of that before you go somewhere, like maybe you should speak their language or have someone who does. Uh, But when I got into Germany, I had to get a driver because it's really good to get a driver sometimes. It's very expensive to have one. But if if you can't speak German and you're driving around trying to read German signs, it's really a problem. So I went to my driver and I said, hey, I'll give you 50 bucks a day if you'll go on the sales calls with me and take that little hat off. And so uh, it worked out really well. And so I went into every single, and then when I was going in, like, what do I tell? I have like 12 executives from Q cells waiting for me. And I don't even know the difference between a photovoltaic cell and a thin film cell. So what do I tell them? And I remembered that I'd done biotech in Michigan. And I said, I know what I'll tell them. I'll tell them I don't know anything right off the bat. And they're all out of academic research. They'll, they'll get whiteboards up and start teaching me. And that's exactly what happened. So I walked in. I said, you know, I'm from the uh, emo, you know, most fastest emerging solar market in the United States. I don't know anything about the technology. Came over to Germany because you guys are the best in the world. And I thought you could explain to me how this technology is breakthrough and give me advice on how Arizona could be successful. We actually picked up a lot of deal flow. And like good academic researchers with PhDs and, and engineering background, they were more than happy to have an eager student that traveled all the way from Arizona to call on them. So one of the things when you're calling on foreign markets and just technology markets in general, don't walk in and act like you know something you don't. And it's okay to show up and not know a lot as long as you put on a, an open mind and a learning cap because there's nothing wrong with doing due diligence. And whenever you're starting off doing foreign direct investment, you're doing due diligence. We do very well in China. Uh, I really think the Greater Phoenix might be one of the two or three premier locations in the country. Uh, 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 I'll I'll show you a little bit how we broke into the China market. Japan, Japan every year is the number one trade and foreign direct investment combined partner in Arizona. And I think I've gotten one deal out of Japan in six years. It costs about 100,000 bucks just to go over and check out Tokyo. You know, uh, we put a contractor on the ground. Japan's a very tough market. Uh, to open up as a foreign direct investment. If, uh, you know, j- foreign direct investment in Japan, it's not for the weak. All right. Uh, a good friend of mine is a guy named Jim Hettinger. I don't know if you know that name. Uh, he was from Battle Creek, Michigan, which is a town about the size of my hand. And Jim brought about 78 Japanese companies to that town over a period of about 15 years. 
and he slugged it out every day. And the Japanese, it's a very long sales cycle, and it's a very careful trust cycle. And Jim and four guys showed up five times a year for six years, and finally uh, somebody who had to do business with American Automotive Markets made a premier investment in Battle Creek, Michigan. He turned it into, has to be pound for pound, the most successful foreign direct investment program in the country. So regardless of the size of your market, you can do foreign direct investment because Battle Creek, Michigan proved that. Canada, we have 200,000 Canadians here. But when it comes to companies, Canadians are very patriotic. They're very nationalistic. And they aren't real fans of helping companies go into the United States. So the Canadians can't wait to see you because they want you to come there. They will put capital into your market. They'll do tourism. They'll do direct flights. There's a lot of really cool things, but they will not cross-pollinate with investment. If they do come, they're going to come with five or ten people. It's going to be a talent play. They're going to, it's going to be R&D-based, and they're going to do a nook and cranny somewhere. Uh, they will make acquisitions, so they have strong capital appetites. Canadians are doing very well. But uh, why open an office in Canada? We're not going to, even though we're on the front porch of the North American Free Trade Agreement, because they, don't, they also do not reciprocate very well. Uh, if you go to Montreal, they're very rude, okay? So put Montreal and London on the same list, except for Montreal is really cool. So go there in August. Second week, there's a great festival. You won't get any deals, but it's a great place. Uh, we uh, started this exchange with Montreal because they have the identical economic footprint of Phoenix. Identical. And McGill and ASU have all these partnerships. And Bombardier has a huge investment in Tucson. And Montreal is a really cool, dynamic city. And we brought all the Montreal leadership. So what we started to do with our market is, hey, people leave our market and go to other markets. We're going to accept that. This is more of a major market strategy. So we're going to help you. We're going to help Arizona companies actually build plants in other countries. We're going to get good at helping you. Because when we bring you into that market, you're going anyway, right? We, it's not like we're going to make the sales pitch for Beijing or Shanghai for somebody. They've already decided they're going to do that. So we're actually going to help it. When we go over there and bring that, we're going to have that investment office understanding we're a source of deals for them, so we become a source of deals back. We worked very hard, helped Montreal tremendously, went up there to have it reciprocated. They did not return a phone call. I'm not kidding you. And, uh, and, and that's, you know, that is personal. That hurt my feelings. But anyway, so these are the little street smart things. So, uh, so where's Arizona doing really well? Spain. How did we target Spain? We went through Germany. It wasn't going well. These are other things you've got to learn. Hey, while I'm in Germany, can you get me in front of the CEO of Abengoa? All right, well, on a map, that didn't look very far. That was damn near the trip back to Arizona. So just because you're over there, you're really not that close to everything. By the time I got to Spain, I'd realized I'd made a second cross-the-world foreign direct investment trip from Germany. You know, flew out of Brussels, landed some other place, slept on a train. You know, by the time I got there, I felt more like a refugee than the CEO of GPAC. Uh, but, you know, I went into Madrid. Uh, we had a major investment with Abengoa, the largest solar uh, investment in the world at the time here in the Valley, a very successful company at Fluing. Because of that investment, we'd helped them here. I got in the, C the CEO, and the CEO set up a dinner, and I met 12 CEOs out of Spain, and we probably have the best top-tiered Spanish solar renewable companies in the world, either in Arizona or coming to Arizona. So good example of how um, you know a little extra step paid off and not being smart enough to realize that the trip from Germany to Spain was like 14 hours. So it was ridiculous. All right, so foreign direct investment is a big opportunity. So how do you know it's a big opportunity in your community? All right, so there's two things about foreign direct investment. I, what I like to do, uh, I, I think one of the most important things is to build a case for foreign direct investment. So FDI intelligence kind of said, here's, here's the world of foreign direct investment and here's some cool stuff to do about foreign direct investment. Uh, and now, uh, if you're in Arizona and you say foreign direct investment, what do you think they say? You should just fly to L.A. every day. Right? Everyone's trying to get the hell out of California. You know, fly back and forth 54 minutes all day long in L.A., one-day trips, go, 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 go. Well, there's a couple of things. We're not the only people in the world. I don't know if you've known this, but California's in deep trouble economically. I'm joking. Of course you've known that, Right. Yeah, no one flies into California but people from Arizona. You will run into 17 governors in L.A. in a good week, okay? So flying into California after Georgia, North Carolina, Texas, and everybody that's in aggressively incentive-based uh, in Arizona is not an aggressively incentive-based 
state, um, you know, it's not that great of an opportunity. And it's not a great way for us to have a relationship with California because we're really business partners with California because we share, we're, we're almost, we might as well not have a state border. That's how integrated we are. So in Texas and North Carolina and Georgia go to California, you know, they're probably negatively impacting Arizona's long-term health. The best, best thing that can happen in Arizona is to ca- have California surge. So these other markets are really net new business relationships. So one of my case-building exercises for communities is we're going to expand our market share. There was no one in Spain waiting to see Arizona, all right? GPEC went in there and banged on Spain. Spain is now coming through. You get the top, you get, you you know, and this is also, you know, company selection. When you're going to go into a foreign direct market, pick the right company to get into your market. Look for industry leaders. Look for people who are considered, you know, uh, compelling, state of the art. So the CEO of Abengoa is like Bill Gates, of Microsoft in Spain. So when he made his investment in Arizona, then all the other top Spanish companies were saying, well, there must be something over there because that CEO from Abengoa sure is sharp. And I'll talk to you a little bit about China. So this is a, a, an optimizing market share, high performance objective for you. It's also a reputation builder. Right? If you want your community to be known for something other than a tired little community, or if you're trying to dust off Nebraska's reputation or dust off I, I was damn good at foreign direct investment. Those Iowa Economic Development boys work hard. They must be all former wrestlers. But they work hard. And so you think of Iowa as a hayseed state. Well, you know, if you analyze Iowa, it doesn't, doesn't come off analytically like a hayseed state. They're very good at foreign direct investment, and they leverage those universities. So you kind of got to build a case. So we start with with our board. You know, the largest uh, job cluster in Arizona is aerospace at 57,000 jobs. So, you know, we kind of categorize it like, look, if foreign direct investment were a company, or if you thought of it as an industry, it would be the biggest industry in the state of Arizona. And yet our governor had never traveled abroad. GPEC had GPEC was considered a pretty prominent organization when I came here seven years ago, and we didn't even have a program. So as an industry cluster, the largest single industry cluster in Arizona, and we had no program. And that's a nice way to sell it, and you'll be surprised how many of you would have an FDI cluster in your state or region that would rank in the top one, two, three, four, just like that. This is something that I'm really excited about, and this is why I was glad I was asked today because I forgot to check this. We launched our foreign direct investment program in 2005, and uh, the Greater Phoenix Economic Council had zero activity. From 2000 to 2005, we had four foreign direct investment transactions, and we had about 17 prospects. You know, we now get anywhere from six to nine a year, and we have about 60 prospects every year. So it's now almost 30% of our business. It was zero in 2005. And you saw from the FDI intelligence report, which, by the way, is a very competent report, it went in decline. So what did we do starting in 2005? We passed eight states. So we grew the market, and we passed eight states. And if you've ever tried to actually measure yourself in succession of another state, compete in R&D or compete in intellectual property, it's tough to move past one or two states. So to move past eight states is a big deal. And I have the eight defeated states on the next slide. I'm joking. All right. Just kidding. So uh, we put a lot of energy into information. Um, um, We're the best information-based economic development organization in the United States. We don't even have a second peer. So if you ever want to come back and see what research and development looks like in an economic development, come on back. I'll be glad to help everybody come through. I, mean, I have seven people who do nothing but acu- – I have 25 people working at GPEC. Seven do nothing but manage evidence and information and data on the marketplace. And we build it and accumulate it ourselves. We do not pull down or purchase data. We do not peel it off blue chip reports. Because when somebody comes in to look at your market anyway, that guy's already got data better than you anyway. So you tell them how many engineers you've got in your market, guess what? You know, they're paying that site selector from Deloitte two million bucks to even evaluate the market. He knows how many engineers you got, and he's got a better number than you do because you've accumulated as a city or a nonprofit, and he just had six people from Harvard do it. So when we build information, we build relevant, unique information. So when we talk to a company, we give them information that is extraordinarily compelling, and it's not macro, and it tends to be very targeted. So when you work with international companies, that's even more powerful 
because, you know, we're going to tell you our IP and biofuels. So one of the things that's really interesting, you saw California and Texas is one and two. Look at their export relationship. Okay, now look at Phoenix. Look at Arizona's export relationship, 21 and 25. That FDI number actually when we started was 31, and that export number was 14. So I don't know if I screwed up the export market by doing that. But we had the largest discrepancy between FDI and export in the United States. And if I showed you all the top communities, they'd be very similar. So now our goal is to be in the top 10 in five years. And what does that mean in jobs? So we measure that. Why do you want to be in the top 10? There it is in jobs. We think we'll be 15th by 2016. And we think we can be in the top 10 uh, by 2020. So now you've got some trend lines. You can measure it. You've got some defined behaviors. You can set some top line data out and keep people motivated to do it. And I think this is a really important motivation, and that is uh, uh, foreign direct investment companies pay higher wages. So they pay 25% higher wages than the national. In Arizona, the range was 33 to 80%. So if I gave you the, the salary ranges of the foreign direct investment hitments we had, they were between 33% higher than our average wage to 80% higher than our average wage. So it's a high-wage play. So it's a market, niche, upscale, high-wage play. Obviously, I put Montreal people up there anyway. I guess I forgot I didn't like them anymore. Uh, world business in Chicago, World Trade Centers. I'll just give you some people. Now, you can see the level of commitment people make. And I don't know why the people in Montreal couldn't return our phone calls because they had plenty of staff. Um, China, Germany, Spain, Canada, secondary markets. Obviously, we're making a big play in clean tech. Um, I'll make this my last two slides. Um, if you look at this, SunTech. We sat down, and I'm going to, I, I'm going to give you a, a professional trick for the Chinese. Okay, this sounds, this is a little American Anglo stupidity. Okay, first off, they're not like the Japanese, and they're not like the Koreans. So just because they're Asian, they don't behave like other Asian markets. Okay, they have a very different personality. Okay, uh, you know, we operate under confidentiality agreements. They will consider that lying. You have to be careful with that. You know, when we, you know, we talk about how China, uh, you know, violates IP laws. Well, they, you know, when we sign non-disclosure agreements, they kind of see that as sneaky. It's kind of a sneaky thing. So when Ying Li found out we had a partnership with SunTech, I mean, it was, it was like you cheated on your wife. You know, we got the how dare you. I mean, how dare us? What do you, what do you think we we're going to, we're going to have a relationship with anybody? Who, well, not in China, because you either have a relationship with Ying Li or you have one with SunTech. You do not have both. And you're either a supplier to Ying Li or you are a supplier to SunTech. You do not have both. It's not like Japanese cultures where Toyota and Honda are mixed match in supply chains. It's not like German cultures where BMW, Mercedes. It's not like American cultures. You know, it's a very highly kind of, you know, vertically integrated business model and they distrust each other tremendously. So when we wanted, so SunTech's the number one company uh, really in China. Its uh, founders were out of the Georgia Tech Research Institute, uh, Dr. Xi, and uh, they raised American capital to get start. Uh, Dr. Michael Crow from Arizona State University, the greatest university president in the country for applying a university to the economy, uh, worked with us, selected SunTech to solarize ASU. ASU is the most solarized university in the United States, and it was solarized by SunTech. And so we were able to get SunTech here. We have 12 companies related to SunTech that are already committed to the market out of Shanghai. And then this is a good example of uh, how we've taken our European and Chinese culture and built them around an industry sector. So depending on where you have, like glass frames, components, and parts, you know, the Italians and the Spanish people, those are some of the best glass makers in the world. Uh, power systems, very good out of Germany. Project management out of Spain. R&D and pilot manufacturing, very good out of throughout Western Europe. And so we sit around and take our solar renewable market and break it up by sectors. And then we overlay the sectors by market and try and tap into the core competencies of those foreign direct investment markets. So I'll leave that up there for you to look at. And I, I promised you I'd keep it 15 minutes. I did it in 20, so that wasn't too bad. So... Um, Again, our website's gpec.org, and uh, if you ever want to come and hang out with us a couple of days, we share everything we know with other people in, the, in their communities because we want to see everybody do well. And uh, I hope this was helpful to you, getting a little bit of a street-smart application of you know, how you evaluate top-line FDI performance. Thank you.